thank you that you're here with us. Uh, we have a uh, speaking for us today, Mark West. And of course, it's uh, better have you with us. And, and we want to keep you straight in line. We're going to have a couple of them with us this morning. And, and uh, we're just uh, glad that you could be here. If you're watching online, you know, come Mark, the uh, uh, hands of the left church and uh, has been preaching for a long time. Teaching, preaching, and serving God for a long time. So we're certainly, certainly glad to have them with us this morning. Uh, sit back and enjoy the lesson and, and uh, be the first of God. Thank you, please, and pray this morning. Would you bow with me, please? Father in heaven, we come to you this morning with hearts of thanksgiving that you despair your life to see one more day, that you give us the opportunity to come together this morning to study from your word and to learn more about you. We ask that you be with us this morning as we study. Be with Mark as he teaches this morning. Father, we realize we are among the blessed. There are those sick, hospitals, nursing homes, sick at home. We ask that you be with each of those. And Father, we ask that you be with the families that saw loved ones in recent times. Help them and help us, Father, as we come in contact with them to comfort them as much as we know how. Father, we thank you that we live in a nation that gives us this freedom. We pray, Father, for our nation, that our leaders would look to you for guidance. We get disgusted sometimes when we see some of the things that our leaders do that's contrary to your word. But, Father, we pray for them that they would see the thoughts and turn to you for guidance. We ask, Father, that you be with those nations on foreign soils that are fighting today, the warring nations. Be with the innocent people there and be with all the people who want the leaders that they would see their errors and, and not punish the innocent people by war. Father, we look at our own lives and realize there's sin in our own lives. We ask you this morning to forgive us of those sins. And if we're found faithful in any, Father, give us a home in heaven with these things we we'll pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're, we're again we're turning to have him on the TV this morning. It's the left time pray at the end this morning. Jack, Don, Drew, Don, Mark. So we're just we're just certain glad that he can be here with us. We appreciate it. Now he and you, my wife, is my better half. I'll have to agree with you. Jerry Clower said one time, talking about his wife, he said, she is my high school sweetheart. He said, I ain't never had another day. I can't say that. In 1980, I went out on a date with a little old girl, and, well, bigger little old girl, and when I went out on the date with her, she happened to be friends with Poochie, so my best friend went, and Poochie went, and we, there was four of us in the car. But me and another girl was on a date. Terry and Poochie wasn't on a date, they were just along. Before that date ended, we had swapped, and him and the other girl was on a date, and me and Poochie was on a date. And that was in 1980. It's been almost 44 years from right now. Because that same year, she got me a belt buckle with my name on it, brass. I still wear it every day. And the back of it that holds to the belt has broke 14 times. But I take a clothes hanger and make a new one and put it back on and put it back on the belt. Uh, I don't know what I'd do without her, I'll just be honest with you. When we go through things and we go to talking about life, we go to talking about things that happen, you've been to movies, do you ever stay and watch when the movie's over, are you like me, and while they go to rolling the words up at the end of it, you get up and leave? I do that. I don't care nothing about watching road. I go to see the movie, I don't go to read. If I wanted to read, I'd sit at home. Those are called the credits. And 
if Chuck Jordan had supplied the cars for that movie, his name would be somewhere in those credits, but it would be real little. So therefore we get things lost in the credits. Today in class and also during the worship hour, I want to look at two guys. You'll remember probably their names. One of them you may not know his name, but it's there. They're not huge Bible characters, but they're there. The traits that they have sometimes get lost in the credits. Some of the things that are with them, I wanted to look at those two things. The first one will come uh, during class this morning out of Acts chapter 18. We'll look at the first 17 verses, but really and truly, it's the 17th verse that I want to deal with just a little bit. But you've got to have a little bit of what's going on. Paul is ministering at Corinth. Um, verse 2, said, well, verse 1, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. So Paul finds somebody of like mind, they are Christian, they are workers, they are people that are of the same trade that he is with, so he stayed with them. You know, when you get around groups of people, and in those groups of people, they migrate together. Teachers will stay together. Machinists that work in machine shops, you'll see them, they'll get together. And they'll talk about stuff, and they don't realize what kind of mathematicians they really are. And when I was a kid, my daddy and both my uncles were machinists, and they would go to talking about stuff in thousands and tenths and all of that, and I had no idea what in the world they were talking about. And I done good to read a ruler. And they, they could get in depth on, people tend to migrate to those of like mind. We as Christians, it's easy to be here this morning. It's easy to be here with you this morning. It's easy to be able to stand before you this morning because we are of like mind. In 2018, I got the opportunity, I'd wanted to go for years. I got the opportunity to go to India. We get to India, we touch down, the brethren there meet us, they're just so happy to see us and everything's going on. They take us to the hotel, we put our bags down and they say, okay, let's go. We're going out tonight, we're going preaching tonight. And they said, you are going to go here, Steve Draper, you're going to go here, Donnie Gammons, you're going to go here, Jack Honeycutt, you're going to go here, Mike Pickett, you're going to go here, Mark West, you're going to go here. I got in the car. Now, the thing about India, you've got to understand when you get there. Here, you can pretty well know if I go this way, I'm going north. If I go this way, I'm going south. If I go this way, I'll go to Carthage. You get off of an airplane in India, you don't know where you are, you don't know where you've been, you don't know how to get back to where you just came from. I spent three weeks lost, depending on somebody else, hoping they knew where we was, because I sure didn't have no way. And the thing of it is, if something had happened to the guy, one man in the car that can speak English and Telugu and can translate for you, if something happens for him, you can't even tell him where you're going. They'll look at you and smile. But the first night, just get off the airplane, just go, I'm preaching at this place, and about, I'm gonna say, 300 feet up the same street, there is a mosque. And you've watched the TV shows, how they're doing the chants and everything, that's going on. So the people that I'm preaching to, there's not but about 12 of them there. 
And I know that there's a bunch at that mosque. And I'm standing there thinking, I'm preaching here. He's up there singing out over a loudspeaker so everybody can hear what's going on. And these guys, in order for everybody to hear and in order to compete with them a little bit, they keep turning the audio up so that they can hear me too. And I'm standing here thinking, this is my first night in India. I've never been over here before. I don't know what's fixing to happen, but I'm pretty sure there's some of those out of that mosque fixing to come down here and just beat the time out of us. But they did. They did. What I'm telling you, what I want you to understand, people of like faith come together. One thing I didn't have to worry about that night, I found out as I went through those three weeks. Before anybody laid a hand on me there that night, they had 12 more Christians and the guys that were riding with me that they had to beat first because they would get in front of you. They would get all around you and protect you. And I came to trust them and I love the Indian people because they are of, if you get a Christian in India, it's a little bit different than it is over here. Uh, over here we have jobs and then on Sunday morning and Wednesday night and Sunday night we come together as Christians. Over there, they come together as Christians and then they go to their jobs too. But if something happens that the Christians need them, they don't go. If they have a job, most of them don't have a job, their job is survival. Get what you're gonna eat today today and smile. The name that I want to talk to you about is a name, Sosthenes, that is mentioned in verse 17 of Acts chapter 18. This man is a ruler of the synagogues and then all the Greeks, the Jews are the ones that are trying him. So a lot of the Jewish people also spoke Greek and were considered as Greeks. So it said then all the Greeks, the uh, Septuagint and a lot of the others say they all, Jews and Greeks, took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat, but Galileo took no notice of these things. He hadn't done anything. At the time, he wasn't even a Christian. He was just the ruler of the synagogue. They were trying to get attention from the judge. They were trying to draw his attention to them. For what? If we go back just a little bit in the passage, uh, verse 4 said, talking about Paul, said he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But... When they opposed him, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. He plays a part in this lesson just a little later on. Paul comes to Corinth. He's on his third missionary journey. He stays next door to the synagogue in the house of a man named Justice, one who worships God, one who does what is needed to be done. And it's a lot different there than it is in Red Boiling Springs. Or Willet, or Lafayette, or the biggest part of the United States today. Yes, we have some persecution, but nothing like what these guys did. Anytime the Jews wanted to do anything to anybody, if they decided they wanted to, all they had to do was get a group, little group together and they'd go just grab somebody, drag them out, beat them, kill them, stomp them, whatever they wanted to do to them. But this man lived next door to the synagogue and he worshiped God and he worshiped God correctly. How do I know that? Paul stayed with him. People of like faith. Paul stayed with this man. Paul stayed with justice. In verse 18, he, Paul in his speaking talked to the leader of the synagogue, one of the rulers of the synagogue, and he converted him. He made a Christian out of that man. 
That man was willing to hear the gospel. We're fixing to have a meeting at Will Ed. We had a door knocking yesterday. There'll be another door knocking this coming Saturday. There'll be door knockings going on all week because that's just the way we've started doing things. You take you a place. If you want to go on Saturday, you go on Saturday. If you don't, if you want to go through the week, you go through the week. You just take you an area and you go and you knock the doors. We have knocked the pain off the doors on several of the houses around there. Everybody has always told us, and I came to believe for a long time, we're wasting our time knocking doors. Rob Whitaker came to Will Ed, and if I learned one thing from Rob Whitaker, if you knock on a million doors, you knock the pain off of them, you're not looking for a million people. It's our job to look for one. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I can go to naming at least five or six names that are sitting in the pew at Will F this morning because somebody knocked on their door. You're looking for one. One. Paul goes to the house of justice. He's looking for one. He finds Crispus. But you see, Paul don't stop. After he finds the one, he don't stop. He continues on. He looks for one more. Any of you ever see the movie Hacksaw Ridge by uh, Desmond Doss, conscientious objector, won the Congressional Medal of Honor, saved 70-something men one night off a of Hacksaw Ridge in the Battle of Okinawa. Never would shoot a gun. But he saved 75 men by going after just one more. And he would pray. Lord, give me just one more. Give me the strength to get just one more. That's what we need to have as Christians. That's, that is the heart that we need to have as Christians. Yes, sir. I know you do. I read your post. <laughs> We're friends. <laughs> I read your post. I read your post on Facebook. And you're right. One. One. There may be one. You may put a thought in somebody's mind. Now, I want to say this. Social media is not always used for good. But it can be. The internet is not always used for good. Matter of fact, most of the time it's used for wrong. But it can be used for good. You're using the internet here today. You're running a live stream. That's for good. That's for good. It's what's up here. Everybody says it's what's in here. What's in here comes from what's up here. Okay? This is your heart. Deep inside you. Your thoughts. What's going on up here? Are you living for God? People in India live for God. Then they work. I mean, Brother B. Ratnam, his job was high in the, well, his means of making his money was high in the government during, in the educational field. John Ratnam, much the same way. But if you go over there and stay with them a little while, you will find out really quick. That's the way they make money. Their job, their job is to convert people to Christianity. That is their mindset. That's what they do. That's what they live for. When they get up in the morning, that's what they do. Work. Work. Knock a door. Knock a door. Paul stayed here 18 months. Because of what he was teaching, we got to look at verses, verse 9 and, and just after just a little bit. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. Paul 
you're doing right. Now, God doesn't directly, and, and, and the Lord and Savior doesn't directly speak to us in our ears right now, but He's still speaking to us every day because He's given us everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness right here. Nothing else needs to be said. When He hung on that cross as a man and as God, when he said those three little words, it is finished. That is exactly what he meant. Not his life. He knew his life was going to continue on. He knew he had the power to lay it down. He had the power to take it up. He knew his life. That's not what he was talking about. What he finished was the task that God had given him to do. What he had finished was the redemption of mankind laying out pure, innocent blood to cover me, you. Everybody that has lived, everybody that will live. It is finished. Three little words that probably have the biggest, well, it's not probably, the biggest meaning for mankind of any words ever, anywhere. It is finished. Nothing else needs to be said. He doesn't need to come to us now. He's given us everything we need. Matter of fact, John 12, 48 says, we have that which judges us in the last day. The words that I've spoken will judge you in the last day. Have spoken, not will speak. Because Paul is teaching and Paul is, is working there, uh, he is taken before Galileo, the proconsul of Achaia. The, this man is a judge. He can do whatever. And he tells the people, he said, they're saying, he is teaching things that are contrary to what we believe. He wasn't teaching things that was contrary to what they believed. He was teaching things that they should have believed, that they should have known what was happening because it had been foretold to them all the way through. They had been told over and over and over, this is going to take place. This is what's going to happen. The Messiah is going to come. This is the Messiah. And they missed it. And they missed it. Now Paul is working here trying to get these people to understand that God wants you to be saved. God wants your life. When we do the Lord's Supper here in just a little while, at the end of the Lord's Supper, that's one act of worship, there'll be another act of worship that will take place, that of the giving of our means. First off, I want you to understand just a little bit about that. You say, well, they want me to give my money. It's not your money, it's God's. He blessed you with it. We need to understand that. He gave us the ability, whatever task we have done, whatever job we do, He gave us that ability. He also saw fit for us to be in the place that we're at. Are we always satisfied with where we are? No. No. Do we look for something better? Yeah. Now I want to ask you this question. When you look for something better and you find a little more money, does your contribution go up? Think about it. Years ago, my contribution was $10. I made $3 and a dime an hour working at a garment factory over here in Red Boy, up on the old schoolhouse. George J. Nova Manufacturing. I got a job at Hartsville at Mueller Brass. I was hired for $3 an hour, going to have to drive to Hartsville, but they hired me on the evening shift and they paid 17 cents difference for a shift differential. So I was making $3 and 17 cents. I drove from Red Boiling to Hartsford for seven cents. I done that for two days. And at the end of two days, the, the supervisor came and got me and he said, all right, we, we're done with this. Said, now then you make five dollars and a quarter hour plus seventeen cent shift difference. Two days. My contribution went up. I stayed there just a little while and I got a little bit more of a raise. My contribution went up. I bid on a job and it paid 
quite a bit more. So my contribution went up. Believe it or not, the job that I went into after I worked it a couple of days, they decided that they wasn't making enough money, so I got a dollar an hour raise. My contribution went up. You know what? I still ain't been able to outgive him. He's still giving me more than what I get, or than what I give. Always. So it's a blessing from God. Yes, we give of our means. We give of our money. We give of the blessings that God has already bestowed upon us. But what I want you to understand is, yes, that's the money side of it. What God wants more than the money for the furtherance of the gospel, He wants you. Knock the pain off of a door. God asks us to carry the gospel through His Son, Jesus Christ. He said, carry it across the world. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. But he has something else in there. Teaching them to observe all things that we have commanded you. That's part of it. That's part of it. God does ask you to give of your means. But even more so, give of yourself. Give of yourself. Yes, sir. Exactly. And to be honest with you, sometimes... There's other things that are better than money. There's other things that are better than money. They grab this man since, since Gallio will not understand, will not listen to what they're saying. They grab this man called Sosthenes, a ruler of the synagogue, trying to get his attention, and they carry him out, and they beat him, but he won't pay any attention to them. Now, he took no notice of these things. We think that's the end of Galilee. No. No. We think that's the end of Sosthenes. No. No. Because if you turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1, whenever Paul is giving his greeting, he also says, And Sosthenes, our brother, some people say that might not be the same man. It might not, but it most likely is. Most likely is. And he's different now. He's not being beaten by the Jews. Sosthenes, our brother. He had an open mind. This man that it's talking about right here was formerly a ruler of the synagogue. And he's become a Christian. Now, verse 8 of chapter 18, Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. He had a part to play in it. He paved the way. I want to see a show of hands right quick. How many of you were raised from a little child in the church, going to the little child classes? How many of you were raised doing that? <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. You are blessed beyond measure. You just don't know. Let me give you just a little of my history. 1809, there was a congregation of the Primitive Baptist Church started in Defeated Creek up in the Friendship Hall. Turn to Carl Woodard's store and go back up in there. 1809 is when that charter came into being. The man that preached there was named Miles Wade West. My name is Mark Wade West. I'm named after my grandfather, which is named after him. He was my great, 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 great grandfather. My family has been there ever since. Miles Wade West was already a preacher when he left Halifax County, Virginia in 1798 and came into the defeated Creek Carthage area in 1799. Brought seven sons with him. 
Someone around here that's named West, if he's been around here a long time, he's out of one of them seven sons. 1809. I was 29 years old before I became a Christian. The first time I went to church, I went with Peachy. I was about 18 years old. I had, we married, we had two kids, and I still wasn't a Christian. We married in 1982. I didn't become a Christian until 1989. And one reason that I became a Christian in 1989 was because I had two little girls that would look at me on Sunday morning and say, Daddy, why don't you go to church with us? I had already stopped going to church at defeated. Why? Because what I had been taught and what I had been reading in this book didn't jive completely. And there was others that had left. And they had went in a different direction and became Christians. You see, you have, some of you have been raised here. You are blessed beyond measure. Some of us wasn't. We had to learn it. Finally, Gene Carter looked at me one day, and he said, Son, you need to preach. You've got the gift of gab. And preach, I tell you that, I like to talk. 1993, he had me do a sermon. I studied and I studied and I studied and I was going to do so good and I was just going to give a lesson on the Apostle Peter and I studied and I studied and I got everything ready and I got up and I, was, I thought they'll have to set me down before I get done with all of this. They'll have to make me hush because they'll run out of time completely. 17 minutes later, I would told them everything that I had learned and made up a couple of things. <laughs> but I didn't quit because I had men before me. Gene Carter wouldn't let me stop. I always knew he had my back no matter what. Sosthenes had one that he could follow. Sosthenes, a man who is mentioned these two times in the Bible, and we're here talking about him this morning, some 2,000 years later. Why? Because it matters. It matters. What he, he became a Christian. He gave up what he had been taught. He gave up things that were telling him that what he was fixing to follow was wrong. It wasn't wrong. It was fulfillment. It wasn't wrong. And he understood that. Why? He had an open mind. Everybody you talk to will not have an open mind. There will be no doors that will be knocked on, that somebody will come up, no, I go to church at so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so -and, -so -and, -so, and they will shut the door in your face. Do you know what you do? Don't get mad. Don't get mad, because believe it or not, the next time you have a meeting, you're going to knock on that door again. You're going to knock on it again. Why? Because it matters. One. We're looking for one. Paul always looked for one. And what did Paul find here? He found the ruler of a synagogue named Crispus and he converted him. He found the ruler of a synagogue named Sosthenes and he converted him. Now I want to look just a little bit about it, at the Jews that were there that were trying to go against Paul. It says the Greeks. But remember I told you that they all, in the, in the Septuagint and several other of the original versions, they, they all, that refers to the Jews and the Greeks, how would you like it if somebody come and just trying to get somebody else's attention grabbed you, this group of people right here grabbed you, carry you out front out here, and go to beating on you? Just trying to get somebody's attention. Would you be willing to come back in the door? How do we treat people? 
If we're good to them, we'll see them again. If we're bad to them, we'll never see them again. And believe it or not, we as Christians, if we do something that will drive somebody away and close their mind, that person's not going to give an account for that. I am. I am. Always remember when you point a finger at somebody, Glenn Ramsey told me this, when you point your finger at somebody, remember you've got three more pointing back at yourself. So Sosthenes was beaten. Sosthenes didn't have been a ruler of the synagogue, but he became a New Testament Christian. We don't need the things that we can take. I mean, we're running out of time. The, the things that we can take from this, some of the things we can take from this, it's not up to us. We don't need to decide who is a candidate for the gospel. It's not up to us. God wants all men to be saved. You remember this name from the news. Several years ago, they had a man that was killing young men, living a different lifestyle, luring in young homosexual men and killing them and eating them. His name was Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer was studied with, would we have done that? While he was in prison, Jeffrey Dahmer died a Christian. He died in prison, still paying for the things that he had done wrong. He still had that to do, but he died a Christian. Realizing he was wrong and everything, that, realizing he was still going to have to pay. He was beaten to death in prison with a broom hammer. But he died a Christian. We tend to look and say, hey, I don't really know whether I want them to come to church or not. I don't know. <coughs> Preacher took a job one time in a different state. Well, when he came up, there was a big congregation. And when he came up, instead of going right to that congregation, he got him some old dirty clothes and he wiped dirt on his face. He messed his hair up and he just stayed around outside. He walked into the congregation and started to walk down front, no shoes on, dirty clothes. He was dirty, looked dirty. And he started to walk down front and they stopped him. And they said, you need to sit right back here. We've got this place for you. And they put him at the back, on the very back. Well, they got up, and as they got up, they said, we've got a new preacher, and we wanted to introduce him, but we don't see him anywhere. He stood up and started to walk down the aisle. This, this old homeless man started to walk down the aisle, and they stopped him again. And he said, you don't understand. i need got something I need to say. Well, they finally let him up and he identified himself as the new preacher. Don't you realize there was people that felt about that talk? He went directly in his dirty clothes, he went directly into a lesson on humility. There was a lot of people repented that day. Why? Because he showed them where they were wrong. It's not up to us to decide who gets the gospel. It's to all men. It's up to us to take it to them. You have two men that were rulers of the synagogue. No doubt Sosthenes throwed his hat in the ring and said, yeah, let's do something with Paul. We've got to get rid of him. We've got to do something with him. He's teaching the wrong thing. No doubt he... But then they grab him and they give him a beating for it. And he is converted to Christianity. He was more than just a nominal Jew. He wasn't just Jewish. He was a ruler of the synagogue. James chapter 2 and verse 24 tells us faith without works is dead. He was working for what he believed. The apostle Paul 
when he went by the name of Saul, did everything that he thought was right, including taking Christians and binding them and putting them in prison, consenting to their stoning. He, he held a coat to those that, he didn't throw a rock at Stephen, but he held a coat to the ones that was there as though they could. And he regretted that. He knew that he was wrong, but he didn't stop. He kept working for one more. Let's get one more. This man, just like Paul, was zealous for what he believed. Romans chapter 10 and verse 2 said, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for good, but not according to knowledge. They have a zeal to do good, but not according to knowledge. It was the Jews that beat him. They consented to it, at least. They did the beating of this man. Ill treatment of people can drive them away. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12, Therefore, whatever you do to men, whatever you want men to do to you, do also unto them. For this is the law and the prophets. Do you want to treat somebody unkind, but you want to be treated with kindness. We all want to be treated with kindness. Matter of fact, if somebody's not treating us with kindness, we'll get our feelings hurt. But just as soon as we get our feelings hurt, what happens? You go to feeling a little heat go to coming up. And it gets on your ears and your ears get real hot and your face gets real mad. And the next thing you know, you're mad enough to bite nails. Does that help? Don't hit your heart none. I'm getting a little older all the time. Mine beats a little louder when I go to getting madder now. Only I go to hearing it in my ear. Boom, boom, boom. I'm taking that from the Lord saying, you better settle down just a little bit. You're too old for this. The old ticker won't take that. You don't need it. That's not the way to handle it. I still have a hard time. I'm not going to tell you I don't ever get ill. I'm not going to tell you I don't ever get mad. I worked with people. One called me one day and told me that there was no hot water on, on one of the halls at the nursing home. I get in the car and I drive down there as quick as I can. I said, is there hot water on the other? Hall? Yes. I said, it's impossible to not have hot water there and have it over there. It's out of the same water heater. Well, we don't have none, so I get down there and I'm going to check it out and I see what's going on. I get this young lady and she takes me back there and she turns the hot water on and she sticks her hand under and says, see there, it's cold. I said, child, you have hot water at your house just as soon as you turn the water on? Let it run a minute. She let it run a minute and stuck her hand under and she said, well, I guess it is warm. Did I get mad? Oh, yeah. And I did eat her up, but I did it <coughs> politely. I did not, I didn't tell her anything out of the way. How we react and how we act toward people can make a big difference. How the Jews reacted toward Sosthenes made a big difference in Sosthenes. Made a big difference in what he did, in how he worked, in how he looked. And he became a brother and was with Paul. When Paul writes that letter to the Corinthians, he's with Paul. Our brother, Sosthenes. This man was open-minded and willing to change. We talked a little bit about that a minute ago, about people that would not be open-minded. People that uh, uh, would be closed-minded. They'll shut the door in your face. And it's aggravating sometimes. But don't get mad. Don't say, well, I ain't never going back there. You may not, but somebody else needs to knock on the door. There is places that some of the men at Will Ed have been told, do not come back up my driveway. So we've got them, we know who that is, and we don't. We don't. Because they told us, do not come up my driveway. Shut 
shake it. As Paul did here, he shook the dust off of his clothes and said, now your blood be on your head. I'm going to the Gentile. You have to shake, sometimes you have to shake the dust off your sandals as a testimony against them and go a different direction. Not to say that what you've done may not bear an effect on them at some point. Okay? That's what you hope for. That's what you hope for. Salvation, I know, I know it's time to stop. Now I'm going to stop right after this. Salvation reconciles former enemies. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's hard to stay mad at somebody when you see that they're trying to do something good for you. It's hard to stay mad at them. It says it's 9.45. They told me to quit at 9.45. It's a good thing because I've told you about everything I know about Sosthenes. I hadn't made anything up yet, but I've told you about everything I can figure out about it. Always remember, treat people right. Don't get lost in the credits. Remember Sosthenes. He's only mentioned twice in the Bible. But he's mentioned twice in the Bible. For being open-minded. I thank y'all for your kind attention.